Well, well, thank you everyone for coming today. And uh, you know, I apologize. I have, I have a little bit of cold, so I might be sniffing like Donald Trump up here most <laughs> most of the night. But I'll try to I'll try to get through it. Um, but uh, you know, thank you all a lot for coming. Uh, so I. Uh, practice social justice journalism and um, you know there's not really a, a time that I can think of that that in which it's more important than right now to be committed to this sort of work and to truth-telling because as I'm sure you all know um, the journalists like myself and my colleagues uh, we are under greater attack right now than at any time I've ever been a journalist um, there are not just here in the United States, but also abroad, um, there have been more journalists internationally who have been killed or, or captured or kidnapped right now than uh, pretty much ever before. So um, thank you for coming and showing your commitment to what I think is uh, one of the most important things we can be doing right now, which is reading and trying to understand and trying to learn who we are and how we can make our society function better, which I believe to be one of the most important things that a journalist and journalism can do. So as I said, I do, I do uh, um, social justice journalism. And, and really what that means is I kind of look at it as the people getting screwed beat. Like if you're getting screwed because of, of your class, because you don't make enough money, because of your skin color, for any reason, because of systemic issues beyond your control or your, your capacity to control, um, I want to talk to you. And I want to hear what happened in your life and, and why everything happened the way it did. And um, I, I've only been on this beat since April of last year. Uh, before that, I was on the foreign desk at the Washington Post covering international news uh, because I used to write about Southeast Asia when I was in the Peace Corps. But they put me on this. And uh, I, I, I've always been really passionate about, about folks who, through no fault of their own, weren't really given a fair shake. And um, I kind of developed that when I was living in rural Cambodia and Southeast Asia. Uh, among desperately poor people who, who uh, were born into it, had, no, had, no, um, had nothing to do with it but besides the fact that they are born there. So I was put on this in April of last year. And in that same month, I'm not sure if you all recall, but that same month is when uh, the Freddie Gray protests happened. And do you all remember Freddie Gray? What happened? Does anyone, can anyone raise their hand and say briefly what occurred there? Anyone know? OK, what happened was Freddie Gray was, um, um, he was poor, he was African American, he was living in inner city Baltimore. And he died when he was arrested and thrown in the back of a police truck um, in which his, his, his back was broken and he died back there. And it resulted in this huge protest. People thought that, that the police killed him. That's what critics said, proponents said, you know, he, uh, or supporters of cops said that, you know, this is, this is not our fault, this is just an accident. Uh, no negligence occurred. But so people, the, the city was, was broiling with, with tension. And my editor sent me a note saying, we got to find a way to get into this story. And so I started looking into Freddie Gray, and I saw that he had been a victim of lead paint poisoning. And Philadelphia also has a, a long history of this, as well as Baltimore, as, long, as well as Washington, D.C. A lot of older cities up and down the eastern seaboard have a lot of issues with lead paint. And that has resulted in an entire generation, oftentimes, of poor African Americans coming into adulthood with cognitive difficulties because of what lead did to them. And I was going to do this story as a way of framing it around Freddie Gray showed that Baltimore uh, had not yet excised the demons of its past when it came to lead paint. That this is something that was still occurring in the city that was still affecting all of these people. And I was going to do a story about that. So I go to Baltimore, I, I go back to his old house, I interview the people that were there. Um, I go to the courthouse, dig, dive through all these court records, trying to figure out like what happened and, and how, how this kid came to be who he was. Um, because what had happened was Freddie Gray, like many, many other people in Baltimore, uh, suffered from cognitive defects as a result of lead paint poisoning, and he sued because of it. And these were such, such a prominent, such a pervasive lawsuits in Baltimore that they developed their own sort of nomenclature or, or um, around it. They call them like lead lawsuits. And um, so he sued, and I went and took a look at it, at those, at, at those lawsuit papers. But I had to file a story that day for the front page. So I just you know, dashed off a 1,500-word story about, about Freddie Gray and, and resulting in, in lead paint in, in his life. 
But while I was doing that, I, I looked and I saw I came across this one form that showed that Freddie Gray had gotten a lot of money because of this. Um, him and his sisters had sued, and because they had sued and they had won, their old landlord had given them hundreds of thousands of dollars, $500,000. And this is such a common thing in Baltimore that people call them lead checks, meaning that if you were poisoned with lead paint and you sued because of it, that person then wrote you a big check and they called them lead checks. Now, this is where it gets kind of complicated. And I understand if your eyes are glazing over, so I'm going to point to a couple graphics here in these stories that can hopefully help you unwind this. But there's something called a structured settlement. And I'm not sure if any of you ever heard of this before. I sure had not when I first was looking into this. And if you're not a lawyer, like maybe none of us are here, you probably haven't yourself. A structured settlement is something when you sue someone and they give you money, if you are not trusted with that money because of your mental difficulties, because you have no experience whatsoever managing money whatsoever, you will receive what's called a structured settlement. And a structured settlement is different from a normal settlement, which almost operates like a, a lottery payout, all lump sum. You get you know, all that money right away. A structured settlement, meanwhile, because you're not trusted with that huge amount of money, it's paid out over a long period of time, decades and decades and decades. It's almost like a job that you can't get fired from. Every week, you get another check. And that check is supposed to be able to help you weather whatever the stresses are of your mental uh, incapacities or the fact that, that you live in a poor neighborhood and you can't find a job. So Freddie Gray was getting one of these lead checks. Every week, he was getting one of those lead checks. But what happened was that this resulted in an entire market, an entire new industry of companies that specifically targeted people like Freddie Gray and others who received those lead checks. And what they did was they said, listen, OK, so you are going to get $500,000, right? And they'd be like, yeah, I'm going to get $500,000. They said, you don't need to wait 50 years to get that $500,000. I will give you a check right now for 50 grand if you just sign over all the rights to those checks that you're going to get over 50 years for $500,000. So what happens is these situations occur where these folks who are brain damaged as a result of the homes that they're born into were selling off hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I spoke to this one woman named Mary Alice Rose, and this is what she gave up. So right down here, right here, this is, this is what she received when she sold off all of her lead payments, all of her lead checks. And this is what she gave up. That's a difference right there. So in one day, in one afternoon, she sold everything. There's this girl who was brain damaged and couldn't read or write and couldn't have a job, sold off all of this money that was supposed to, supposed to keep her afloat her entire life. And she sold it all off for $62,000, the amount that was worth $573,000. Um, and this happened in one day. So I started, doing sto I started researching this and started trying to figure out how I'm going to be able to tell this story. And, and the main problem here with these sort of tales is sometimes I tell stories about very complicated things like structured settlement. Like, who the hell knows what a structured settlement is? It's like super wonky. Like, we're not lawyers. I'm like, how am I going to tell this story about something that's like really arcane and really difficult to understand and actually get, have people get it? And hopefully, like, you all understand it now. Do you all understand what I'm talking about? Does this make sense? You're with me? Structured settlements? OK. And um, so the idea is, and this gets back to just how, to, how, how journalism works is um, hopefully if a story's done well enough, you can, you can tell really complicated issues and really complicated ideas through very simple tales. And what the story really was about was not very extremely complicated lawyeries and courtroom shenanigans. The story was about people who were victimized twice. And the story was, was about feelings of inadequacy and feelings like, you know, um, um, or, or, or fear, you know, I, I, I need this money now. It's about feelings of desperation. And these are sort of basic human emotions that everyone can understand and everyone's felt themselves. 
So the trick is to be able to take these extremely complicated ideas and tell them through the vehicles of people and their emotions themselves. So that's the story of this, this, this girl named Mary Alice Rose. And then I, I, th this is a story that I did um, about this man here. His name's Terrence Taylor. And uh, this kind of gets at the idea I was just talking about. I'm not sure, can you all see this very well or clearly or not? Kind of? From there. Is it clear up there? OK, so he was, you know, when he was a boy, he was tragically burned uh, when he was six years old. And he had burns, like this is just part of him. He lost his arm there. on his arm. He lost a leg. He lost a hand. He's burned all over his face and all over his body. And, um, and this is the same sort of thing where, you know, he was someone who was six years old. And he was given a structured settlement that was worth millions of dollars. And um, um, over the course of um, 10 months, he sold it all, millions of dollars. And he got, he got in return about a tenth of that. And he blew all of that money um, because he was a man who, uh, as a result of how he looked, he'd, he never had a girlfriend. He never had a wife. Um, he never really felt loved in that way. He, he blew it all on strip clubs and, and women he met on Facebook. And uh, the story of Terrence Taylor, what I was trying to explain before is like this is a really complicated thing um, as far as like how this all happened for this guy to end up destitute and, and homeless. Uh, this guy who was supposed to have, supposed to be set up for life. But what it comes down to is the fact that it comes down to feelings of human inadequacy and, and feelings like you can't, um, um, feelings of, of loneliness. And, and if you're able to take a very complicated idea or complicated story and tell it simply enough, and really be able to boil down to the base meaning of it. It's a story about a man who, who never found love and he wanted to. So he sold it all off. And how this works, these sort of stories, these structured settlements, and the reason why it was so, um, the reason why this, these systems were so broken was because of the fact that the courts in Virginia, and I'm sure in Pennsylvania, in Pennsylvania too, and, and across the country, had pretty much said like, OK, so we know that there are companies out there that are going to try to bamboozle these people and, 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 and buy up uh, you know, what their structured settlements are for pennies on the dollar. So what we're going to do is we are going to pretty much relinquish. We're going to say, we're just going to give the responsibility to the courts. We're going to say, a judge decides if this deal is good or not good for, for this person. So every time that someone wants to sell off some of their structured settlement, uh, that deal has to go through a judge. And a judge has to say, like, OK, this deal is in that person's best interest, so I'm going to say that's fine. It goes right through. But what, that ha what happened then was a result in a situation where these companies would search the entire state for one judge who would, who would then, say, who would then you know, approve every single one. Because some judges would be like, that's insane. We're not gonna, we're not gonna approve this deal. So they would move on to the next judge until they found the right judge who's gonna say, yeah, let's do it. Um, so what the story was about was that in Virginia, uh, where there are many people with structured settlements, there are many transactions like this, every single one was put forward by one attorney in one obscure courthouse, handing it over to one judge who approved him at a rate of 95%. And so we had situations like this, like this man here who had millions of dollars and over 10 months he was left homeless and destitute. And that's the judge right there. Um, so, let's see, there's another. If you can bring this up here, what this looks like. But anyway, so I guess the, the, the idea though is, is to pretty much take away the complexities of. of hard-hitting investigative reporting, because there's a lot of investigative journalism out there that I think fails on this regard, because it doesn't really, it doesn't really get down to you know, the, the person to person, that didn't work, person to person connection and who we are as people. It's about telling stories first and foremost, and, and using you know, our own personal antenna to be able to get there. Um, but you know, that also brings up the point where I, hopefully a lot of you are here about this because you're passionate about journalism, you're passionate about social justice, you're passionate about change. But, but there is an issue now 
with, with the fact of um, you know, this conflation of journalism and social activism. And I, I, does anyone think they're the same thing? So do you think that, these th that they're the same, that, that journalists can be social activists, that they can promote change? I see you nodding your head. Why do you think so? I mean, I think if they're passionate enough and they're, if they do enough research and are able to share this for people who aren't aware of the issue, then they can make those other people aware and hopefully it could turn out to be something bigger than what it is and make more people aware. Yeah, I think that's, really, I think that's a really good point. Um, and I agree with that. And I think the most important thing you said just now is the fact that uh, they do the research for it. Um, because sometimes, you know, in, in, in today's, you know, media, we see a lot, at least when I'm on Twitter, I see a lot of people in their Twitter bios saying, like, activist, journalist, you know, all these things. And sometimes I, sometimes I think that, that conflation can be deeply troubling. And I think that's part of the reason why people are losing a lot of trust in journalists, a lot of trust in, in media representatives, is the fact that um, they think that we are going, we're first doing the story and then doing the research to support that theory, a, a case of confirmation bias. And, and I think, I, and I would strongly urge all of you, if you as you go on in your careers and if you want to do this sort of work, is that um, the most important thing is to first understand the integrity of who you are as journalists and that, that you know, the truth needs to be the most guiding light in, in the work and, and to not let your own biases or your own notions about what right or wrong guide you, but at the same time to understand that when something is messed up, something is messed up. So, and to feel that sense of moral outrage. Because um, when I do this work, I get mad every time. I get angry. And, and I want to hold people accountable. Because, you know, things, when things aren't right or when someone's getting screwed because of no fault of their own, I mean, people need to be held accountable for that sort of stuff. And, um, um, you know, we got to catch the bad guys. So it's, so it's, it's this balance right now, and I think that balance is, is more important right now than ever because uh, it's not just, you have to have that moral outrage, but you also have to be uh, very, very disciplined in your writing and also your thought processes. I tell when I you know, come and talk to students, I, I say a lot that you have to be very empathetic in your reporting and very apathetic in your writing. Um, that that you, have to, you have to really understand why people are the way they are. But when you get back to your typewriter, not typewriter, when you get back to your computer, and it's time to actually write something, you have to be like, my, my first objective here is the readers, my first objective is the truth. And you have to be willing to have people not like you. And that's a hard thing. That's a very hard thing. You have to be willing to have people not like you. Um, because sometimes, you know, the truth really hurts. And, and people who, even people who like you as a person, may not like the story that you do. And that gets to be very, very difficult. Um, but that sort of idea, what I was talking about, though, with the idea of like between social, social justice and activism and, and journalism, they, they're getting conflated a lot these days. And I think there should be a clear separation between I am an activist and I am a journalist. These are two different hats. And when you make that decision to be an activist, you're no longer a journalist because I'm not going to trust you. I'm not going to trust your, your, what, what you're writing, what you're saying, because it's coming from a viewpoint. You're trying to take the facts and shove it through an agenda filter. And when, what comes out, I don't trust. So I would just say, in, in a lot of college campuses, you know, people are very passionate about what's going on right now. But I would also urge anyone who wants to do journalism to temper that to a certain stage. And if you really want to do stuff that, that actively and can promote change, you have to always honor that sense of integrity in yourself. Otherwise, people aren't going to believe what you're saying. So here's another story that I did recently. And um, this, is, uh, this is another complicated story about, uh, about gentrification. And there's a lot of gentrification, obviously, in, in Philadelphia and um, in Washington, DC as well. And what occurs um, is this story was, was about eviction. And um, I really wanted to get in and try to understand how eviction was working and, and what, was, what was going on in the system. So I, I uh, started calling up local um, attorneys and asking them, like, what, what's wrong with the system? What, what, needs to, what needs to change? And if you're looking for uh, ever ideas 
So this is a tip for if you, if you want to get in journalism and you're looking for store ideas, don't be afraid to call someone on the phone and just be like, hey, you know, I'm interested in this topic. What in your experience isn't working? And to get at those sort of ideas, you should be calling up people, if you want to do social justice journalism, calling up people who are civil rights attorneys, people who are local activists, people who are on the ground floor really working with the communities and with the people to try to understand what's going on and what's, what's wrong. And so I called up this attorney and, and he's like, you know, it's crazy is this, this place over there that they're about to, you know, uh, this aging husk of, of the city's past, they're about to transform it into, you know, this, this paragon of the, the city's future. Um, people are getting evicted for 25 bucks. And I was like, $25? That's insane. I was like, my lunches, you know, some days cost $25. And someone's going to get booted out their home for 25 bucks? So, so I went and I did this story. And, and again, this story is dependent on one person. Telling a story, a very complicated idea, through one person is always, I think, one of the best ways to ever tell a story or a frame. You really want to be able to get at very complicated ideas and complicated notions through one person's story. Because at the end of the day, we're trying to tell stories. This isn't, this isn't a prosecutor's memo. This isn't, a, you know, this isn't Wikipedia. Um, it's just one person's story and what they're going through. And, and if you can achieve that, you can almost, in a way, trick readers because they're going to learn all this stuff because they're going to be engrossed in whatever the story is. They're going to learn all this stuff about whatever, and they're going to be like, oh, wow, I just learned all that stuff. And because, because your, your writing style, hopefully, will, will absorb them in that. Um, so these stories, what change did they have? We have, we have a couple stories about uh, structured settlements um, and that, that people we're losing tons and tons of money, people who needed it, and people who are mentally incapacitated. And then we have a story about you know, people getting evicted for 25 bucks. And this is another very important lesson in, in social justice journalism. It's like, what was the result? Because ultimately, we do stories because hopefully, you know, some good will come of it. Hopefully, some change will happen. Hopefully, people, by shining light on something that's wrong, hopefully, institutional powers will kick in and, and right whatever was wrong. So in structured settlements, Maryland legislature and Virginia legislature swooped into action and they passed a, a strengthened laws that, that really cramped down on these sort of activities where these companies were specifically targeting victims of lead paint poisoning to make millions of dollars. And that was an amazing thing. And the, the company that I specifically wrote about, uh, the um, Maryland Attorney General said those guys violated the law and, and, and went after them for violations of the Consumer Protection Act and fraud. That was great. You know, the, it's, it's a great feeling to write something and have you know, change occur because of it. Now this story, it came out and nothing happened. Nothing at all. I wrote it. And uh, you know, people read it that day. I got emails that day. There was a little, there was a little backlash that day, but then we just moved on. And that happens too. It happens a lot. It's actually more common than not. Is that you know, you write something and uh, you hope people read it and you hope something good can come up, come of it, but nothing does. And that can be dispiriting and discouraging, but you know, it doesn't mean you can stop. And uh, um, so, you know, we keep on writing the stories and hopefully something good will come of it. And, um, and so how did I get here, though? And that's probably a question maybe, because I look young, I know, and, and I only graduated college myself 10 years ago. So how am I here right now? And that's um, and, and talking to you all. And she kind of gave you the, the, you know, the back story a little bit about the fact that I, you know, I went to University of Iowa. And I was just like a lot of you then. Um, and I wanted to be a journalist. I knew I wanted to be a writer, but I had no idea how to get there. And I had no idea how to get from here to there. So I realized then that you know, I had to do something that was going to make myself different. Um, I had to do something that was going to you know, differentiate me from everyone else. Because I was just one guy coming out of the University of Iowa in the middle of the country. I was so far away from all this major media. 
I had no chance of getting on any of those jobs. My first job in journalism at that point, I used to drive around this small town called Cedar Rapids, Iowa, to all the gas stations and write down the gas prices and take it back to the newsroom and put, that, put it in for this little news bubble in the paper the next day because people were interested in how much gas cost. And, and that sucked. Um, so, I, so what I did was I decided to go do the Peace Corps and learn another language and um, live in a completely different part of the world and hopefully use that to start writing about stories that matter and stories that people care about. And uh, it wasn't easy because most people can't even point out Cambodia on a map. But, but I realized that if you're able just to t write about people, in that same way that we're all people no matter where we come from, write about in that very empathetic, passionate way, people will read it. But that was, that was probably um, uh, a decision that if, if any of you want to get into this line of work and you're interested in becoming a journalist, I would encourage you to figure out some way or somehow that you can do something that's going to differentiate yourself. Whether that is going and living someplace that no one else is right now, picking up a, you know, getting a major in French and then go and living um, in Western Africa and writing stories about what's happening there. Just something that's going to make yourself different. That someone like me at the Washington Post will pick up an application and be like, wow, that's super cool. I want to talk to that person. I want to see what their life is. Um, because right now the competition is such, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard, for getting jobs in journalism institutions. I mean, we're, we're, in, we're an industry under attack. And under attack both by our executive branch and also just economic forces. Um, and also people hate our guts right now. They do. And it, it's, very, it's a difficult uh, atmosphere to work in. I, I have to tell people, I have to remind them constantly that when I say, like I did this story, I can pull it up for you all. Um, it's about this guy. I did do, so I did this story about this guy who carries his AR-15 wherever he goes and, um, and what his life was like. Because I was like, why would someone take an AR-15 to the airport? <laughs> That's crazy. And, um, so I did a story about him, but I had, to, I, had to, I had to tell him over and over again that, like, listen, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do a hatchet job. I really am curious about who you are as a person, and sadly, this won't work. But, and, but I had to tell him that a lot. And so what I'm, what I'm saying is the fact that we are under attack from a lot of different areas, um, and that is causing shrinking newsrooms. So it's very difficult to get a job right now, but it doesn't mean that's impossible. And when ten years ago. People were telling me the same thing, that they're saying that, you know, that, that uh, you know, you can't be a journalist, that, that, you know, there's no jobs, that the pay isn't there, all these things like that. And, but I really wanted it. And, and, I, and I, I truly believe then, as I do now, that, that if this is something that you want to do, there's no better time to get into this than right now. Because there's no more important time to get into this than right now. Because journalism is one of the most important aspects of a functioning democracy. It's under attack like never before, and it needs people who to be who are honest and have high integrity, and are truthful to get into it and, and, and tell amazing stories that will bring readers in. Um, and with that, you know, I just wanted to open it up and, and uh, if any of you had any questions and about how I got the how I got here or or uh, bits of advice that you that you need or you know questions about any stories I've done, I mean, please ask away. Yes. Yeah, sure. So I, uh, I moved to um, Southeast Asia, in Cambodia, and I lived in uh, the central province called Kampung Tom. And I lived, um, I first lived with a host family for a short period of time, and I moved on my own, and I got uh, uh, very fluent in the language. And, um, and I uh, realized that, like, you know, I'm kind of in a place that, like, no one's writing stories about where I am right now. But, I was, I was, just by happenstance, the, the village I was living in was a kilometer or two away from where Pol Pot grew up. And, and like, so I was like, wow, this is, you know, a, a crazy place to be. So I went and I, and I, I went and I did a story about that village. And I asked a bunch of people, like, did you know Pol Pot was from here? And no one had any idea. 
It was something that had been uh, something that had been so shunted to the past that people had just purposely tried to forget the whole thing. But but what what was important about it was the fact that I went into that sort of uh, atmosphere and that sort of country with the idea that I want to be a writer and I want to do stories. So, um, but I didn't know anyone. <laughs> I didn't know anyone. I, I mean, like I'm from Madison, Wisconsin. When we were here, Iowa, I came out with zero contacts. <laughs> I had no network. And so what I did was I realized that no one was ever going to listen to any of my letters or any of my pitches or whatever. They, were, they, they just wouldn't have responded to some guy off in Cambodia that I've never heard of before was pitching me a story. So I would just do the story without, without having anyone already willing to take it and just send it off. And I'd be like, this is a story. I'm going to write it. And I'll just write it. And I'll send it off, and like people wouldn't respond, and I'd write them back, be like, "Did you get it?" And they'd be like, and they didn't respond, and then you had to keep on doing it over and over again until one time an editor did respond, and uh, um, and then I was able to take that and then develop that relationship and continue getting things published. And then at that point, I was able to take that story and send it off to my with my next pitch and be like, "Look, I've been published here and here," and then they'll realize, you know, I'm a, you know, I can actually do this, and you go from there. But in the very beginning stages, it's immensely difficult. It's very discouraging. And uh, the only thing that gets you through it is just you know, the joy of actually doing the work itself. Because if you're not having fun, like, you're really not going to make it in it. It's a good question, though. Anyone else? Any other questions? Yes? So are those stories you did them while you were still with the Peace Corps, or did uh -huh. you stay in Cambodia after you were finished? Um, while well, I was still with the Peace Corps, I did a number of stories. Um, I did a story about um, um, in Cambodia. They they don't really have any film industry, any TV industry. So um, when you're watching TV, everything's dubbed over from different countries. But there's only five. There's only four people in the entire country who do dubbing. So every single character on the show is no matter what show you're watching, they all have the same voices. And um, so I did a story about like who the, who are these people with these voices, and. Um, I did another story on, on Cambodia's first gay town uh, and, and, uh, and kind of an exploration of what, what being gay meant, meant in that country. Um, and, and I did a story on, on how, uh, you know, witchcraft in the countryside and, um, you know, how folks were, were murdered if they were accused of, of being witches. Um, so those were stories I did when I was in the Peace Corps. And, um, and I would just take the money, whatever I was. I wasn't really allowed to accrue any sort of wealth on the Peace Corps, and I was just to kind of donate to some charity or some of that effect. Um, and then when I left, I was off in, in uh, I went to Columbia for grad school. And at that point, um, I went back to Cambodia, and I did this, this, this book that maybe I can pull it up. Um, I'm not sure if, is the internet working down here? I don't know. It looks like it's working right now. Yeah. Oh, that's uh, that's the uh, the review of it. Oh, one second. <laughs> anyway, so uh, so I did this book then about how um, about how this was like uh, uh, what what happens in these communities when what what development means in a lot of these communities because in in a lot of rural places in developing countries, they hold, there's this huge rush to be like, we got to develop, we got to develop, we got to develop. We got to build this highway, we got to build this skyscraper, we got to build this golf course for, for what it becomes a burgeoning elite. And this is happening in Cambodia too. But what was the, uh, what was the inverse of that? You know, this very heralded story about how a country develops. What's the inverse of that? And who are the people who are being displaced or the people who are losing their homes as a result of this golf course where a bunch of Chinese billionaires are going to play. And I was able to, to really get into that story and, and tell it through the, through the focus of, you know, a group of, of um, because Cambodia is kind of interesting with, with, its, uh, with its culture, the fact that if men were protesting, they would just be immediately arrested, if not killed. But women inhabited a capacity in that culture where, um, where they could just protest and nobody would beat them, nobody would arrest them, they could just go on. So I did this whole, told this whole story about this through the, through the prism of five female protesters who were leading a nationwide movement against, against development. You know, the sort of idea that everyone thinks development's great. Well, they didn't, because they were going to lose their homes and where their family's going to go. And, um, 
And so I did that story after I left Peace Corps, and I, I went back and did the reporting for it then. But thanks, that's a good question too. Anyone else? Yes. The, uh, did you ever dig any deeper into the judge and why he was uh, uh, doing all 95% of Yeah, I don't, you know, that's something I tried. I tried very hard about that, about the judge. Because it wasn't just in Virginia. The judge in Maryland, there's this one judge, Herman Dawson is his name. And, uh, you know, I'm not, the, no judge in either of the stories ever responded to my calls. I went to their homes. I, I knocked on their doors. I left them letters. Um, any, any number of things. And they just never responded. Um, and I, I, think, I think part of the reason was because I don't think they quite understood. It was such an arcane niche thing that I don't even think they understood what was going on. And they kind of just signed off and moved on their way. Did you ever suspect what he was getting out of it? And was he ever disbarred? I know that he lost the election next go around. Mm -hmm. that, they, that the election happened uh, you know, maybe five months after the store came out. And it was a big campaign issue. <coughs> so. I know he lost the election. I don't know if he was ever getting anything out of it. I, I, I was able to wind together a couple points here and there about how the fact that the, one of the lawyers who is in, in Maryland who is putting together um, uh, all those packages for the judge's office, he used to be a clerk in that same courthouse. But beyond, beyond like a couple things here and there, I could never really, you know, it's like chasing shadows with, with that. And so to follow up, uh, did, uh, what were those people getting? monthly or weekly in the structured settlement? So if you, if you got a payout for like 500 grand, um, you would get like, it would, it would rise and it would go up with, with in, uh, inflation. It would keep pace with inflation. But a lot of them would get, uh, you know, two grand a month. And two grand a month doesn't sound like a lot of money, but two grand a month can oftentimes be the difference between uh, crippling poverty and stable poverty. And there is a difference. Uh, and and that, that really was what, and when they lost that, that's when they kind of sank lower than they were already. One last question. And after <coughs> the uh, Attorney General in Maryland uh, changed things, were these guys ever made whole? The Attorney General was trying, they're, they're, it's still wending its way through the courts right now, that they're trying to do something to make these people whole. But what happens, and this is where it gets complicated, as complicated as it already was, but okay. so. The structured settlement, right? Someone sells it off, and they're selling off when they when they sell out the structured settlements. They're selling off. They're selling off payments, you know, uh, from now until decades from now. So long, they're selling off things that are going to pay out in the future. And what happens to all that? Where that where's that money go? Uh, what happens is an investor comes in and they buy them up, and then they sell it off to just regular consumers. So let's say mom and dad or grandpa and grandma are planning for retirement. And they say, geez, I want to buy some payments that's going to help me with, with my retirement plan. All of a sudden, the payments that they're buying used to belong to Vern, Vernon Davis um, um, in, in inner city Baltimore. And so it, there's this churn like that. They used to be you know, this very poor person because they had their brain damage real late and poisoning now belongs to you know, someone in, in Texas or something. Kind of, it goes everywhere. So. Um, so it's the city government that's doing these payouts to the citizens that were damaged by the lead paint? No, that's a good question. It's, it's, not, it's not the city government. They sue the landlord. Okay. And then the landlord has insurance through like MetLife or something like that, so some large insurer. And then the insurance companies are paying out to the... So if the person didn't sell that payout, they would be getting... Uh, yeah, these, these are AAA uh, rated institutions, financial institutions. They're not going to go under, so they'll just continually be paying these folks. Yeah. I think I saw a question from you. I was asking if you um, are working on anything right now. Yeah, I am. I am right now. I, uh, so right now, I'm, I'm, I've actually taken a, a brief sabbatical from the poverty and social justice beat, and right now I'm on the, uh, the national enterprise team, so I just kind of go out across the country and tell stories. and. About, about whatever I think is interesting. And I got really into the idea. I got a couple stories coming right now. Hopefully one story that's going to come out this weekend that's going to be big. Um, it's, I got really into the idea of, so so much of the shootings that go on in America, the way it's, it, the way it's covered and the way we conceptualize it is either through the frame of a mass shooting or a terrorist attack. But it's just like a drop in the bucket of, of what shootings really are in this nation and how many people are affected by this. 
So I got really into the idea of, of doing a story about one single family that was affected by a shooting. So I spent several weeks with this, with this, um, uh, with this family in Birmingham, Alabama, in which their three-year-old son accidentally shot and killed their nine-year-old daughter. And, and how you then move on and um, raise a child who killed your other child. And this is something that happens dozens of times every year. And, and the, the guilt and the feelings of complicity in that, because someone left out a gun and, and that happened, um, is, is something that, that you know, was, was one, probably the hardest story I've ever had to spend time with them, because it happened six months ago. And I was with them you know, for weeks after that. And you know, they were, uh, I was honored beyond belief that, that they allowed me in to, to tell that story. And that was um, one of the most difficult aspects of like, maintaining that apath empathetic while I'm there and apathetic while I'm writing, because I recognize that these people aren't newsworthy. I mean, they're just, they're just regular folk who are dealing with an awful thing. And uh, what I say in this story will define them in, in the public eye for the rest of their lives, probably. Um, this is like the most important thing that, could, that has happened to them in their lives, and I'm going to write about it. So that sense of responsibility to get it right and to tell it truthfully um, is, is paramount. It's huge. I mean, I, I wake up at night thinking about it. Like, what are they going to think when the story comes out? Like every every night before a story, a big story comes out, I can't sleep at all because I'm I'm terrified either I mess something up, or I'm gonna either I mess up something up and I'm gonna get sued for it if it's an investigation, or I just broke some family's heart, and uh, they're both equally difficult to deal with. Um, and I got this other story coming out right now uh, that I was writing actually while I was taking the train up here. Uh, it, I, I, I the whole idea was I was gonna do the story about these guys who. Um, uh, I was going to do a story about the rigged election narrative. And I was going to spend this, this election night and for a few days afterwards with a couple right-wing bloggers who were pumping out conspiracy theories and really hot on the rigged election narrative. And I really wanted to deconstruct how that starts and where it goes from there. And, but then Trump won. And I was like, oh, jeez, what are we going to do now? And so I had to kind of turn it around to something different and you know, write, about, uh, write about them in a different frame. Because the question is, like, you know, these guys write all these things, but uh, do they really believe it, or is it just a way to make a buck? And that, that becomes kind of the tension in the story. But for that story, and also the one about you know, the family, and also about the guy who brought the AR-15 to Walmart, um, I mean, these are stories that, like, I have my own opinions about things. You know, we all have opinions, we're all human, about gun rights, about you know, the election, about this or that. But, like, you know, you cannot you know, ever divulge those when you're out there with people like what I think about something. And people all the time ask me, like, so what do you think about this? And like, so what do you think about me taking this gun to the airport? <laughs> and like, under normal circumstances, they'd be like, that's, that, you know, that's crazy, man. That's nuts. But you know, I have to, have to more or less just say, like, you know, that, that's very interesting to hear you say that, to hear you do that. Because it's really important for people to think that they're going to fair shake from me, because I hope they are. Um, but, but I think that's, that's one of the most difficult things that, that we now face as journalists, especially in this hyper-polarized state, is like, how do we uh, write empathetically about people and not let our own prejudices get in the way? Um, because I, I, think that I think certain things about gun rights, but at the end of the day, I mean, like this family who I wrote about, they still have guns in that house. Guns are still a really important thing in their life, a really important thing in their culture. And and it's up to me, it's incumbent upon me as a journalist to try to understand that pathology and try to understand that thinking without immediately discrediting it. Because that's not going to help anyone understand each other. It's just going to make things worse. So, but that's a, thanks for the question. Anyone else? Yes? Um, I was just wondering what the best tool is to ask like, the big journalists like in your opinion. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think that's a good question. Yeah, I think the best aspects are, I mean, nothing beats seeing your name in print. I mean, that's like the best. And like uh, uh, having your name on the front page of the Washington Post is like, is like nothing else. And if the day ever comes that I don't like that anymore or it's not thrilled to me anymore, I know that, that I shouldn't be doing it anymore because the cause it, it, a job can be very difficult. It can be very high stress and pressured, not just with deadlines. I don't feel that as much, but just with the the knowledge I could destroy someone and that power differential. Um, and if I get something wrong, if I get something wrong and I say, you know, that guy murdered her 
and he didn't. I mean, I could, I could, you know, that's th those are things that I find very difficult. So I, I fact check very carefully, and I worry about that all the time. I worry about like, did I just, did I just tarnish the credibility of the Washington Post? Did I just do this or that? And uh, if you ever, and that's something that you know, I, I have difficulty with that sort of anxiety with it because it's very anxiety inducing. Because especially if you're doing a story where you're really going out on a limb and no one's ever done that story before, you really got to check your facts. Because no one had ever written about structured settlements before, ever. And uh, before that came out, I was worried because it was so arcane and so uh, insular that I could just totally miss something and messed it all up. So that was, that, that's probably the worst part about the job, is that, is that anxiety. Yes? Yes. It sucks. <laughs> yeah, I've had cases where I've injected errors into the article through fact checking, and that's the worst. Um, I mean, nothing ever profound or big, but yeah, I've messed things up. Yeah, um, I've messed things up. I one time said, I did this story, uh, this is like a long time ago. Um, I was writing smaller, sort of like internet stories at the time. I did a story about uh, you know, in Ireland, there had been this this woman had found there, there, next next to this home of unwed mothers, they found 300 baby skeletons in, in 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 a graveyard next to it, and I wrote that they found it, but really they hadn't found it. Really, just the woman thought they were there, and uh, I was you know I was very chagrined about that because you know I went overboard and I overstepped and I felt terrible about that. Um, but yeah, I've messed things up, and it, it's the worst every time. And I worry about that all the time, because we got to run corrections in the paper, and that's very embarrassing. So that's the sort of thing that I always get very bemused about um, when, when folks and everyone says, like, the lying media, you folks are lying all the time, just lies, lies, lies. And I'm like, that's, cr and that's insane. Because if I lie, if I mess something up, I get in big trouble. I could lose my job, and where my wife going to live then? And like, I, I think it's the craziest thing ever. My first concern is getting it right so, you know, I'm not in trouble. And this whole thing about like, I'm gonna lie for some, some owner or some interest that's beyond whatever the truth is, it's just, it, it boggles my mind that people think that. And uh, if anything comes at this talk, hopefully it's that, that, you know, we don't lie. <laughs> I mean, uh, journals mess up sometimes, but actively lying, it just, it's, it's, it's crazy talk. It's crazy talk. Anything else? Yeah. Get into the racial aspects of the lead poisoning, and have you done any uh, stories yeah. on the Black Lives Movement? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely have gone into the, the racial aspects of the lead paint poisoning because you can't run away from that, considering that that uh, the preponderance of people who do deal with this are are African American, and um, and the result and the reason that that's happening is because of the fact that uh, because of racist policies from decades ago, redlining or segregational, segregation sort of attitudes, a lot of poor folks of color were shunted into certain neighborhoods that just absolutely atrophied. And that they were living in places that were falling apart. And I got readers from all over the country uh, from people being like, well, there was lead in my house. I didn't grow up with any brain damage. Well, you know, that's not what it was. Lead paint becomes very dangerous, not when it's just purely lacquered on the wall, it becomes dangerous when, that, when the landlord doesn't care about the unit and lets it, lets it fall apart and then lead paint chips are going all over the floor. And the fatal flaw of lead paint is the fact that it's sweet like candy and that, and that kids uh, will go up and, and put it in their mouth and be like, wow, that tastes really good. Back in the Roman Empire, people used to use lead as, as sweeteners, um, that this is, this is a sweet product. And, and that's the reason why it becomes so pervasive, is the fact that you know, people always said he ate paint chips. Why would anyone eat paint chips? That's crazy. Except for the fact that it tastes good. And uh, uh, that's what happens in a lot of, a lot of poor communities of color. Um, and I think there's a, a clear racial aspect to it, and you can trace it directly back to policies that were imposed back in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, as far as the Black Lives Matter, it's become such a divisive movement and I find, that, I find that to be tragic. Um, and uh, obviously now like, it's become a political you know, movement if you're pro-BLM or if you're anti-Black Lives Matter. And um, I, I, find that to be, I find that to be tragic because I think that um, in the same way that folks are try desperately to understand 
the pain in, in poor white communities in Appalachia, but they should try to understand the pain in poor black communities in Baltimore. Um, I think so. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you think the uh, tweet about Michelle Obama falls into the realm of social justice? What tweet is that? I missed it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It was just a horrible tweet. That, uh, that who, who did? Some uh, woman. Mayor in a city in West Virginia. Yeah, it wasn't just a mayor lately. who tweeted it. It was a woman who worked for some kind of foundation. People say terrible things on Twitter. <laughs> say terrible things on Twitter. And because uh, uh, I, I, I really want to do a story right now about a Twitter troll and really profile someone who just like ejects tons of vitriol and hatred in the atmosphere. And so I have, I've interviewed a couple of them. And the crazy thing about that I always find is the fact that they are, say the most awful things online. But as soon as I get them on the phone, like somehow the basic norms of civility return. And they're like perfectly functioning nice people. And it's like, what is going on here? It's like, it's this weird sort of sickness that happens, you know, this vitriol. But yeah, yeah. Anyone else? Anything else? Audio and visual, uh, audio and video in your work, because you know, for a while we were told that it was the end of uh, black and white and newspaper text writing, and everybody was going to do video stories. Yeah, I think I, I think a while ago that's what you when I was going through college like ten years ago, everyone was all all hot about about video journalism, about you know we're all going to do it all. We're going to take video, we're going to take pictures, we're going to do audio, we're going to do the whole, we're going to write stories, the whole thing. I mean, it was so schizophrenic and bipolar. It was insane. And, um, and hard. I mean, like, and I, I don't think it's really come to pass in that way at all. And I think that was a really flawed idea. Um, because I think mostly what people want is just good stories. And, and they want, um, they just want to understand. And my editor right now, who's, uh, you know, this Pulitzer Prize winner won a MacArthur Genius Award, just this like phenomenally talented, brilliant man. His name's David Finkel. He hates video in the story, absolutely despises it. That one time someone put a video on my story and I called him, and he, had, he, he freaked out. He's like, we gotta get that video out of there. I hate that. Because his idea is like, if the writing is good enough and the story is good enough, the writer should be every bit as good as a videographer in stitching together the story and painting the picture of what's going on. And why would you ever put a video in the middle of a story that's going to bring someone out of it? Don't you want to have their attention? Like, we're, the, 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 the websites can become so schizophrenic. And there are all these things going on left and right, click on that and this and that. And he also despises uh, interstitial links or links inside articles. Because like, why would you ever give someone an excuse to leave your story? And I kind of agree with that. I see what he's coming from. Um, but it, uh, um, I think like audio and video, and, and I don't know how to work a camera. I don't know how to work audio equipment at all. Um, and you haven't seen it as an impediment to your career. I've not seen it as an impediment, no. Because I feel like, I feel like uh, a lot of journalism schools nowadays teach kids, or say kids, they tell kids they need to know all these things. Well, really, hopefully, they should be saying, you need to get good at telling a story. We need to teach you how to tell a good story. Because that's what's going to get you a job. When you send a story to an editor and they say, wow, that's a great story. I want to talk to this person. Um, because they're going to hire someone to do video who knows how to tell a great story doing video. Or they want to hire someone who, does, who knows how to do a good story with film, or with, with pictures, I'm sorry, or with, or with text or words. And just the most important thing is just really understanding how to tell an awesome story that has great beginnings, fast-paced middles, and breathless endings. Say yeah. that again. <laughs> Great beginnings, fast-paced middles, and breathless endings. Okay, I'm gonna remember that. Yeah. Well, any more questions? You know, it's gonna be here for a few more minutes. So if you have any personal, or I have some cards. I brought some business cards here. If anyone's interested in yeah. having one, um, also I can give you my email address. If anyone's ever interested in just. I know sometimes group settings can be, you know, hard to raise your hand or whatever. But if you just want to write me or say whatever, you know, if you have a bit of advice or something, it's Terrence. That's T E R R E N C E. Dot McCoy M C C O Y at washpost. Dot com. And please, uh, I mean, I know what it was like, you know, ten years ago, uh, you know not having any contacts or anything like that. And I will always remember the people who wrote me back and how great that felt. 
So I, I always write people back whenever they want to talk about their, anything at all. So I encourage you to, to do it. Good opportunity. So come on up, everybody. Yeah. Or if you want my cards, cards are up here too.